Woo. Hey. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Whew. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. I was reflecting on the fact that a bunch of my favorite streamers now start with a nice chat to welcome everybody in. I'm thinking at some point we are going to have enough viewers for that to make sense. And I'm excited for that time. That will be a cool time. Uh, today, maybe not yet, but, but I see that we have a couple of you and I'm excited and grateful. So thank you. Uh, if you are a viewer in the U.S., happy long weekend. We're celebrating Memorial Day. Uh, fun fact. Memorial Day was created by black folks in Charleston, South Carolina in 1865. Uh, you may see a history that says it started in 1868. Incorrect. 1865. Uh, and it was originally, as you might expect from the date, to honor the U.S. Civil War dead. And it was particularly, it was a big event that celebrated and was thankful to the Union soldiers who died in a particular prisoner of war camp. Um, and ensured that they had a proper burial and that their graves were marked in flowers and all that stuff. And it was written up at the time. Pretty exciting. Um, so it has morphed from, as all holiday weekends do, it has morphed from being a time of remembrance to being a time of barbecues. And, um, you know, you do you. Uh, but happy weekend. I am starting out the weekend. Where are we at? I am starting out the weekend with... Um, so what my family used to do is uh, my grandmother and now my mom would take Memorial Day, we may do this tomorrow, I don't know, um, to pick tons of gorgeous flowers out of my grandmother's garden and take them down to the family plot at the cemetery and lay them out on the, the headstones or graves of all of our relatives. And that was, it is a practice that I'm not really faithfully doing but i kind of think about how nice it would be if i did do it that would be cool but it was our family's way of remembering our family's people um, not specifically civil war related although we do have uh, my mom's side of the family has uh, union civil war uh, veterans in it um, in my in our direct ancestry my father's side of the family has both on his father's side is union and on his his mother's side is some confederate war heroes because that is what it's like to be a person of european descent in america whose ancestors were here before the war so these things happen um but uh, so memorial day a time of reflection and a time to, to think about our family and the people who have gone before and we are wrapping up today the maternal month of may so I said at the beginning of the month, we were going to celebrate the things we can learn from the moms in our trees. And so here we are at, uh, here we are at my original tree that we started. Hey, Phoenix. Oh, so good to see you today. Cool. Well, we're right back where you last saw us, right? We're back on Grandpa Hammond's tree. And one of the things that I was reflecting upon is that we have spent a ton of time since we started the stream working on grandpa's father's side of the family the hammond line and part of the reason that we spent so much time there is because it's easy um what i i think is true anytime i'm building out a new tree is that some of the lines lend themselves to a lot of like oh wow this goes really good we found a bunch of stuff and we're gonna we're gonna race backwards and add a bunch of stuff and add a bunch of siblings and we will have found out a bunch of information and so the hammond tree strangely enough even though it wasn't that for me for a long time um although the shumways shumways were one of the first big finds that i had and that was one of the first ones we talked about here on the stream uh, shumways being up here starting with with emily here so a good illustration of how a maternal line, even though it's on my father's 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 line, that great grandmother, what is that? Second great grandmother? Yes. Yes, second great grandmother. Um, she opened up a whole world of a ton of research that we haven't, here on this stream, we've done a little bit. We went up her Shumway paternal line, but we haven't really plumbed all the depths of all of her maternal lines. However, what we haven't really done is we haven't given as much treatment to Ella here, uh, who is my grandfather's mother. 
we had good information about her as a married person because eugene and ella we found a decent amount of stuff we found marriage record we found lots of them living together so married in wisconsin lots of information about their life in you know census records of their life in iowa yes i consider three to be lots and then lots more um, there's even more than is in this tree because Ancestry has a very cool thing called the city directories. Um, if you have ancestors who lived in a, even a small city, um, like it doesn't have to be a really large area, but although Buffalo is a good sized city, but I have seen them for even smaller cities inside of states where it's basically the precursor to the phone book. And since this was all, oftentimes this was pre-universal having of phones, um, it wasn't a directory of people's phone numbers, but it would tend to include things like their, uh, their, well, it would include their address, their spouse, and their occupation. Occupation being a super cool thing. And you could use something like occupation to track them as they moved around the city if they had different addresses. And I have also done a project, I did a thing with the city directory in Buffalo to track all the different Hammonds and group them into households based on who was living with who. So you can tie folks together where, for example, um, if you can tie someone living with a sibling and then later on you find that sibling or earlier then you find that sibling living with a parent you can start to draw the connections right between people when sometimes that is difficult uh, that was real helpful in upstate new york especially because uh when i first started researching the record availability in upstate new york was so bad it was just so bad uh, but today what i wanted to dig into is something we started in an earlier stream uh, where we were talking about trying to figure out uh, where Ella Wilcox came from. We know her surname from Mabel Hammond McKenna's death certificate. So that's her daughter. We don't have that name in my grandfather's death certificate. I don't even remember if I have his death certificate. But his family didn't know what his parents' names were. So when they filled out his death certificate after he passed, like he may have known, but he was gone. Um, and he hadn't thought to tell them before he left. But Mabel, whatever happened with Mabel, she told her next of kin who her parents were so that when her death certificate was filled out, it was filled out accurately and it had Ella Wilcox as the, as the surname. So we went looking for Ella Wilcox in, um, and it made sense to look in Wisconsin because she didn't move to Iowa until after she and Eugene were married. So they were married, or rather, we know that they were married in Wisconsin. Uh, it is a safe bet that at least one of them lived near that area. And then after they marry, we find them as, uh, as a household, we find them in Iowa. So, uh, so we went looking around for, and then what did we, we have Eugene, prior to his marriage, where is Eugene? Let me just remind, Eugene was actually already in Iowa. So he traveled back to Wisconsin. Now I'm curious, how far is that? Because we can, we can look that up. I've actually not looked this up before. Okay. Uh, Beaver, wait, Butler County, New Hartford, Iowa. Because that's basically where they were. It's in Beaver Township is really close to here. So here's Iowa. Now let's do directions. Rock County, Wisconsin. That'll just give us the center of the county. Close enough. Well, it's not close. Especially not in the 1800s. Right? Pre-cars. That's not close. So he had, we don't know, we don't know what the reason was, how he met her, right? So his family had already moved to this little town outside of Waterloo, Iowa. And so he's living there and she's living in Rock County, Wisconsin. And somehow or another, somehow or another, they get connected, they meet up. We don't know how that happened. I still don't know how that happened. So that's kind of fun. But 
uh, it seems really unlikely that if they both lived in Iowa, they would go back to Rock County, Wisconsin to get married. That doesn't make a ton of sense to me. So we would want to look for what's she doing in Wisconsin. So we'll go back there and look. And now, we already did a little bit of this on the stream previously. We found here, um, and we have her age from all of these previous census records, right? Oh, sorry, all of these later census records that we had previously. We have her age when she from when she died. We have her age as it was reported in all the census records after 1880. And I believe all of those do actually report an age, therefore an estimated date of birth. So we knew that she was born around 1856. So now we know that what we're looking for, so she's married and ancestry is so helpful. Uh, free version does this, right? If you put facts in, it's going to calculate the age for us, which for certain people on the stream can do that in their heads. Uh, high chat, people can do arithmetic in their heads. Me, not one of them. So this getting handed to me is super helpful. Uh, we know now because of this, she was about 18 when she got married. So we're looking for her to be about 14 in 1870. And it won't fill this. I could add an empty fact that says lived somewhere in 18. Why don't we? Well, 1850, we won't. Uh, lived somewhere in 1860, and I don't know where. I could do that without the source. Right? So in theory, I could do that. And then I would know that I was looking for a four-year-old, 14-year-old. So what we found was in the 1870 census, we found Ann Ella Wilcox living in Rock County, Wisconsin, which is not a big populous county, um, living in Rock County, Wisconsin of the correct age, like right on the correct age. So that seems promising, but we have some issues here, right? We're always trying to figure out um, I go back to the genealogical, hang on, I'm going to wave that book around because I totally dig this book. Here we go. Uh, Elements of Genealogical Analysis, awesome book with methods that I recommend. Um, the way we're thinking about that is that we're trying to say, is the person described in this record over here the same person as the person described in this record over here? Are they talking about the same people? And then we can chain those together until we have a profile of a same person who is fully described by all the records that we're able to find. So here's what we don't know. We don't know for sure that the person who married Eugene Hammond here in this marriage record is the same person as the person who married, um, as the person who is living in the 1870 census. We don't know if that's the same Ella Wilcox. And Wilcox is not a rare name, and Ella is not a rare name, so it's possible that there could be other Wilcoxes. Um, this is where I'm just going to do, I'm going to just let us have done some magic. Um, the magic is this. I was contacted many years ago by a relative who also had an ancestry account who is related to uh, I'm pretty sure it's actually related to this person, Mary Wilcox. He is a descendant of Mary Wilcox, who is a sibling of Ella, and he had the family research done. So this is an example of where collaborating and talking to folks, hey, Tamorius, thanks for being here. So uh, this is an example of where connecting with family through different sources is free, and can add light years worth of stuff to your research. So my cousin, a descendant of Mary Wilcox, said, buckle your seatbelts, we've got lots of cool stuff to, to, to share about this family. And so it turns out, um, because this is what happens when, um, it turns out, as, as somebody guessed on one of the prior streams, um, we ask the question, why is Ella Wilcox living in a house with people who have different surnames? And someone on the previous stream had the exact correct guess, which is, what if that is an aunt or an uncle? What if they are in an aunt or uncle's household? And the answer is yes, that is exactly what has happened. Uh, something has occurred to the nuclear Wilcox family, where the nuclear Wilcox parents are no longer around, and... Uh, in this case, it is Nancy Finch is the biological aunt 
of these two children and has taken them in because their parents are not around. And what has happened to the parents is, well, that becomes real. But what you see is a lot of this household disruption. Um, we had actually good luck with some of these tragic sort of parents dying young, um, helped our research on a couple of different lines because when parents die and leave minor children, they leave behind court records of where the children go. And that gives us a court record that gives the parents' names and the children's names in the same record. That ties everybody together. So that's super cool. We didn't have that in this case. And I actually do not remember whether we have. We won't because Ella Wilcox's father didn't die young. He ran away. He ran off. Ran off never to be seen again. Uh, we have no idea what happened to him, but he had run off in the years between 1860 and 1870. So if we go back and look at a happier time for this family, we will find that this is the household that we would expect to see under sort of socially expected conditions, which is a mom, a dad, some kids all have the same surname. We're expecting that this is kind of everybody fits together. And look, we have Ella and Mary here. And Ella and Mary are the same matching ages to the two girls that are in the household in 1870, right? Um, and they're together, which is helpful. And the other thing that persuades me a bit that this is the same person is that mysterious middle initial. We know that all the way through to the end of her life, Ella used the middle initial H. We, to this day, have absolutely no idea what it stood for. I have never seen it written out. Uh, we don't have a family Bible or a family baptism record that would shed any light on what that H stands for. So for me, it is an absolute mystery. But there she is. She used, and she continued to use it after she took the name Hammond. So she went by Ella H. Hammond in some records after she got married. So that H is actually a pretty powerful clue based on the fact that that is, an, that is how she reported her own name, right? I am very suspicious of middle names when I don't find evidence in the record that that person used that middle name or that middle initial. Very, very suspicious. Um, we may It may be something that came out of a family Bible and somebody knew, but I don't know it unless I have a reason to see that it's in a record somewhere. So I want to see at least the, you know, the family Bible or something. But because she was so diligent about using it, and we have, so we now have sort of a chain of evidence that kind of fits to me. We have Ella H. Wilcox of the correct age in the correct county. We then have, and that persuades me that that is probably the Ella H. Wilcox who married Eugene Hammond. I feel pretty good about that. And then we have Ella and Mary, her sister, of matching ages together in this household. And then they're together in this different household in 1870, which persuades me that, yes, this is probably in the same county, right? Same age, same county. I am reasonably confident that those are the same people that they're traveling, they're moving together. Therefore, I'm plugging them in here. I still don't know, right, based on records, I still don't know exactly who, um, exactly who these finches are. But we can now start to plug in that. And what we did, we did this last time, was we've got, uh, oh, and I did my trick of I've got, a, I've got Chester in here with a question mark. So my question mark is, I think it's pretty likely, but I'm not 100% sure. And the question mark reminds me to be careful about uh, how much extra data I hang off of this profile before I'm sure. Do I want to add all of Chester Wilcox's parents and siblings and other children and their spouses and all the cousins before I know for sure whether this is the right guy? As I talk about all the time on this stream, I try to be a little guarded just based on, I, I ask myself the question, how much of this do I want to have to go back and delete if I'm wrong? How many profiles do I want to have to go track down and find in this tree and delete? Because Ancestry doesn't make that the easiest thing. 
Um, and in this case, because it's an ancestry tree, this is my tree. This is not a shared global family tree where I say, oh, well, at least I helped somebody else research their families. I'll just leave this here. If it's in my tree, I want it out, right? This is my tree of my folks and it's a private tree. So I'm mindful about what I want to delete. Um, it is actually a little easier to clean things up on a public tree like WikiTree, which we've looked at before, or the new trees on FamilySearch, because those are shared trees. So if I collect a bunch of information about Chester and it's correct, right, but it turns out Chester's not my relative, that's fine. I just disconnect wherever the wrong connection was made and the rest of that family goes along. It's happy. It's merry way. Good for us, right? Like, that's great. There we go. So here's Harry. Here's. Oh, yeah, I told you on Wikitree, one of my other cousins, not the same cousin I was just talking about. Uh, she one of my other cousins plugged in the a belief that Ella's full first name was Llewellyn. I have no records that show that, but I have a cousin who knew other things about the family who said it's true. I'm not going to go in and delete this, but you will notice that I didn't add it that way in my tree. A uh, big difference between those shared family trees and kind of needing to negotiate, right, and be thoughtful about other people's research. Um, I have pretty strong opinions about my own research, uh, but I learned from working collaboratively over here on Wikitree that stomping into Wikitree and telling everybody to do it my way uh, doesn't work well, doesn't go well, doesn't make friends, doesn't improve collaboration. So I try not to, which is partly why I like having a private tree where I can have my standards and say, this is what I think has been proven because there's stuff on Wikitree in my, my family line that I don't think is valid. I don't think is proven. So I feel great about being able to come to my tree and say, I controlled what data went in here, right? That to me is important. I see that we did not add the rest of the the rest of Ella's family from the 1870 census. I wonder if that'll be one of these hints and I can add the rest of them because I do want to go ahead and plug in. Uh, yes, here it is. Is that it? No, wait. No, mm, very good. OK, good. This is going to be a conversation we'll get to have. This will be great. OK, what I want to find is yes i believe this is the one i want this is the one that we have ella and her sister in let's make that bigger there we go um let's make all this a little bigger oh that's much better that's much better for streaming okay so we have yes this is that same family record that we were just looking at right we were looking at chester we have um some middle initials that i actually want to check Let's go look at the original. Mmm, good stuff, right? Love this. Okay. Open question here. Okay, we have. Um, I am not fully convinced that that's an E. That that's an E. I think that's a C. But I can understand where it could have gone either way. Right, because there we have right here an example of a C. It looks like that. Down be right below it, we have an example of that seems pretty clearly an E. I don't feel like that's the same. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have the swoopy. Okay, we don't have that swoopy bit. Right, so that swoopy bit is a C. Not swoopy bit is an E. So I think that's a Chester C. Wilcox. That matters in a few minutes is why I'm, I'm making a thing about that. And we have these children, which is great. Something else I am curious about is whether there might be a finch anywhere nearby. But I don't immediately see a finch. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to spend a ton of time searching the pages yet. We'll have a chance to do that. But let's say that we agree that this is our guy. We're gonna save him. They have recently changed this interface and I don't love it, honestly. Used to go to another page, don't love it. Uh, used to click the site source by default, it doesn't now. All right, Bradford Emerald Grove. Oh, 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 Bradford Township. There we go. So I'm standardizing the place 
because there are times when I extract this data and I do things to compare the places. And so standardizing places helps me um, with a lot of what I do. Um, I also just, it's, it's soothing, makes everything look similar. All right, I'm gonna save Chester. Is it gonna ask me? No, so, it, ah, because it's 1860. So in 1860, the census in 1860 didn't include any information. Let's go, let's go look at it um, again. It didn't include any information about how the individuals in the household are related to each other. It just doesn't say. And therefore, uh, Ancestry's indexing doesn't have enough information to group these folks together in a household. You and me, because we're eyeballing this, we can tell that this is likely, it's not guaranteed, but it's most likely a Sp uh, spouses and their ch and their own children. We can we can guess that that is likely to be the case. Uh, so we'll go ahead. Hmm. We can now go here. Oh, the other question would be, do we think that that uh, somebody indexed it as Mariah E. And we don't have a surname in here because we don't know what her maiden name is. I have a way that I deal with that, but I'm not, I'm doing it a little differently right now. Okay, so we have, um, do we think that's probably Maria, not Moria? Um, it could be Mariah, right? It could be some, any number of things. Okay, so here we have loads of hints that we're still sifting through. And this is, yeah, see, this is where we're gonna start to piece together again siblings become really useful and interesting. Um, now we have some stuff that's sort of tantalizing here that's gonna be, if I jump on this find a grave record, I can add a lot of other information to the tree, right? But I don't yet know where that record came from, don't know its provenance, don't know a lot of important things about it. It does appear to be in the right location, Rock County, Wisconsin. And it has a couple things that match, but I tend to skip over those early on and look for what is this, this, all this stuff on find a grave was entered by people as opposed to being copies of records. Uh, now, the people who created that may very well have had access to lots and lots of records. Cool. Uh, I don't know yet what those were. So I tend to go to things that are records first to see what I can build up. And the first thing that I want to do, that it's not, I was going to see if it was going to give me this and make it easy, and of course it's not, is I want to just add the rest of that census record so that I can see what the deal is and what age we get and what other information we get from it. So there's a way to do that here. It's a little cumbersome, um, is what it is, but we can go into, here we go, view record. So we're viewing the record for Chester here and that's who we're gonna we're guessing is Ella and Mary's father what we want to do is we want to add the rest of the family here it's a small enough family and we had real good luck with siblings in Harry Hammond's tree so we want to see if we have any luck with siblings elsewhere what we can do here is each one of these is a link to the line item for that person on the census. So now what we have is the indexed record for this person. This is Maria E. And uh, somebody else, probably me, entered this correction. Nope, not me. So Wilcox Maria E. Oh, and look, that's another cousin. That's not even the cousin I got the information from. So <coughs> if we go look, do we agree that that is probably, well, I see where they got the idea of the O from. I'm going to say that O is actually how they wrote it on the census. That's actually how it's written. That's how it's written. Now, census taker might have been wrong, uh, or it might be hinting to us that her name was pronounced Mariah rather than Maria. Maybe that's why they chose to spell it that way. Uh, but we don't know. Um, just to guess. So, yeah, it does look like Mariah E. It does indeed. Uh, but what we can do now that we're on her record, is that we can save this to her. We just have to look her up. Since it wasn't given to us as a hint, 
there. We just have to go find her. And now we can connect. And this is the old user. Remember, I said that the thing on the side over there, I didn't, I wasn't crazy about. This is the old one. It's the one I'm most familiar with. Like it better. It is what it is. Um, so here we are in Bradford, Wisconsin. Terrific. Looks great. And now we know a useful thing, which was based on this one census record, we know roughly her age. That is great. Of course, we don't know her surname prior to marriage, but uh, we now know that she was about 25 in 1860. Go us. Uh, and now we also want to add... Ah, we want to add new people, and Ancestry is annoying about adding new people, so I'm going to do this the way I do it. I'll show you what you could do. What you can do is you can go back to this record and select William. Now, remember that William's not in our tree yet, and we can go save him to someone in my tree and add to a new person. Great, right? Looks good. Fills in pretty well. Um, well, let's see what happens. And we do this. The only thing that happens here that is so annoying is I don't get his residence. It doesn't create a residence fact, but it created the birth. It, it did save me a bunch of typing. So I'll give it that. And then what I can do is the mildly annoying thing of go here. And I remove the record. That's annoying. And then I save it to William Wilcox, who now exists. And now I get to fill in the residence fact. I really value having that timeline because it really, really helps me understand other records as they come in. So even though I had this listed as a source, I didn't have the residence fact. And remember that that to me is a key difference in using Ancestry as a tool as opposed to the other ones, right? We talked about the, the first big difference is these are private trees. I own this. This is my sandbox. The other difference is Ancestry does a beautiful job of having a list of facts in a timeline and all of those facts are connected to the source records on Ancestry that I used to, to verify that fact. So that link between the source and the fact is super important. Over on something like Wikitree, you just have to hand write all of that. So you have, if I had bothered to write a biography for, for Ella, which I haven't yet, uh, or someone, someone else were to write one, it would be up here. All I have is just this list of sources. And you'll notice that even I did not go create a timeline of facts and link all of these sources to facts. Because on Wikitree, that's incredibly cumbersome. And so I just ain't, I ain't done it. I just typed this stuff in and I said, you fit here. I gave you all, I gave you all the breadcrumbs. You figure it out. You figure it out. Right. But at least it's enough that if someone were to come in, they would be able to know where I get my ideas from, what I, what I think I know. Um, and then we could actually go, we could take this guy over here and look at her on family search. Family search is getting there. What a... I don't love is, I love hate with, is we have her vital, vital records, birth, christening, death, burial. Great. Uh, up here in our own section, and then everything else is down here. I don't know. I'm used to seeing it in a straight up timeline so that I can just see the order of events. It helps me big thing it helps me do is catch errors because if you get a census record that was actually before this person was born you will notice it if it's in timeline order right uh, you will also notice fun things like children that are born too close to the marriage Woo! Uh, which does not happen near as often on my tree as I frankly expected uh, a little disappointing but okay so we now have uh, through a two-step process we have now added William Wilcox great go us uh, we can now go and go back to the record and loop through. And yes, for 1860 and 1850, uh, those are the two census years where, um, it's actually, there are three, the two census years where they are listed by name as individuals, but not described how they fit into the household. And Ancestry does not attempt to link them together. It, it 
shows who was in the household together, but it doesn't try to describe the relationships and therefore ancestry doesn't try to recreate the relationships in the tree. Uh, 1850 and 1860, that's true. Uh, interestingly, 1870 also didn't indicate the nature of the relationship, but ancestry has been doing some work where they have been going back through and reconstructing a hypothesized relationship so that if you look at a record like this in 1870 ancestry indexing folks have created something that says we think this is two parents and their four children and those are people's guesses. That is not supported by data that's in the record. That is a guess. Same kind of guess that we just made in looking at this record. Okay, so now I'm going to go to Walter. The reason I'm going to do this is that, again, we're going to get some, we're going to save this to a new person. We are going to get some sibling-based help once we get these folks plugged into this tree. So it's worth it to me to do this work. Uh, because if you were watching a second ago when we were looking at a bunch of the hints for the mysterious Mariah, uh, some of those hints involved records for children other than Ella and Mary. And if we can start to tie all of those together, we're going to play the same trick as we did with the Hammonds, which is if I can link, let's see, I'm going to remove him from here. If I can link the sibling to the other siblings and then the sibling to the parents, then I got these, all of the siblings are now linked to the parents, right? So that's what I'm gonna try to do and that's why it is useful to add siblings. Because Walter may know things about his parents that Mary didn't know. Especially if Walter was older when his parents died or ran away, which is what we're going to find has happened in this case. Okay, so then we had Ella. We already have this record attached to Ella, so she's good. We go here. We'll just verify that that's true. Why, yes, that's this is the tree we're working on here. I have noticed I have, I have a stupid number of copies of people in trees, uh, but this is the one we're looking at. So she's here. So do we just need to now add Mary? And so Mary's going to be here. Mary's going to be a new person. And this, as a reminder, Mary is the sibling that my cousin is descended from who gave me a bunch of information. It actually turned out the youngest daughter was the one who she had information that passed down to her family about what happened to her parents. Or maybe she just had a, maybe she had a descendant who was as dogged a researcher as I try to be. Um, and got there first. Good for him. All right, so then we do this the silly ancestry trick of removing the record and re-adding it in order to get it to tell me where, uh, to get it to plug in this residence fact for me. Slightly cumbersome, but I still like it better than typing that fact in by hand. Boom, there she is. Sweet. So now we have Mary. So now we can go back up and look. Oh, look what it didn't do. It didn't attach the parents. Of course it didn't. I didn't tell it to do that. Neither did Ancestry. But, okay, hang on. Doing a thing too quickly. All right, I'm going to click on. So it didn't add her parents. Um, Heck, it didn't add her sibling either. Oh, it didn't add her siblings either. Okay, so she is now in. If I go look at her in the tree, I forgot that it was going to do that. She is all by herself in this tree. She is all by herself, not connected to anybody. So she's in the list of people. If I go Wilcox here, right? All of them are in the list of people, but these new siblings that I added are not connected to each other. Oops, at all. They're not connected to Ellie either. I thought they would be. Y'all were watching me do this and you saw that that happened on the pre previous two children too. <sighs> but it's fine. So it's pretty easy to add uh, because I can just click here and instead of filling in the data, I go to the top left corner and it says select someone who's already in your tree. I do that. Um, I will say, man, I love the autocomplete here is so good. It's really good uh, because all you have to do is literally you just have to type the first three letters and it starts giving you matches. 
Um, it doesn't do partial matches or if you come at it from like the end of the name or whatever, it really does have to be the beginning of the name. And I think it actually has to be the beginning of the first name. So if you have a lot of Georges in your tree, which you will after a while, um, or a lot of Edwards, um, you might get a long list. But in this case, because we're still just getting started on the street. So here he is. Great. So there's, and then we don't get Mariah. So we got to add her to Mariah. Oops, wait. <laughs> That's not what I wanted. Mariah. And no, yeah, see? So we got those. But if I go to here, here's Mariah. Dink. Okay. So now if I go to Chester, I can also do it the other way, right? So we now have Chester and Mariah with Ella and Mary, which is what we thought. Um, and we now need to remember who those other people were that we just added. And we need to add... William and Walter. Do we have more than one William? Nope, that's the only William right now. So there's William. And remember that William and Walter are not listed as related to each other either. So they're all just hanging out all alone in the tree. Now they're all connected. Ew, 1860 census is such an annoying place to start. Right? It's so much nicer if you have a family that got, that stayed together and they're in 1880 is the ideal because that's when they started to collect relationships and you can, it will reconstruct the whole relationship. 1880 is, uh, 1870, pretty close. Sadly for us, this family was already broken up by 1870. Um, in, in a way, like for William and Walter, they are old enough that they were nearly 20. Uh, nearly 20? No. No, but they were in their late teens, right? They were in their late teens by the time the 1870 census rolled around. And you will notice, too, that William and Walter weren't in the household with their aunt and uncle. Right? They were old enough to have gone off on their own. Probably, I, I would guess we're going to find them working as farmhands. That's going to be my guess. I don't actually remember. So, But Ella and Mary were well underage. Right? So we've got, uh, she's 14, 13, right? But he's 16 old enough to be a worker. He's 18, old enough to be out there. By the time 1870 comes, uh, we can't rule out that, that, that Ella and Mary were the only two, right? We don't know yet uh, that maybe that maybe it was just the two of them. The other thing that can sometimes happen is that you'll get a parent who became ill, and so they can't take care of younger children, but they're still living you will sometimes see that younger children have been farmed out to relatives' houses, even though the parents are both living and maybe they have the older children with them, right? So it, various kinds of things happen. Uh, but what we wanted to do now is see what does that tell us? Yeah, let's start with, let's start with mom here because what does that tell us about Mariah or Maria? I'm going to go with Mariah because of that spelling. I think that's how they pronounced it gonna guess that. All right, well now let's go see what's going on in the hints because now we know Mariah's age, which we didn't before, and we know her for these four children. We don't know for sure that there weren't additional children born after 1860. That is possible. We just know that who whatever happened after 1860, there aren't children, Ella and Mary aren't in the same household with them. That's all we know right now. Um, and we don't know that these two are still living, right? There's a bunch of stuff we don't know. But what we have is this one, this 1860 census. And then we know that Mariah is not around um, with Ella and Mary by the time of 1870. We know that. So let's go find out what can go along with that. I'm going to ignore that. And I'm going to ignore that because I always ignore pictures. But now we have, and then remember, we have this find a grave record. I might go look at that, but what I want to do first is I want to scroll down and look at the recordy records, all right? Because I see some interesting stuff here. The first one that really, really catches my eye is one that is just such a good match. We've got a Walter A. Wilcox, which is exactly the name of one of those siblings, with uh, Chester and Betsy as parents. So what this is going to be is Walter's marriage record. And we also have Walter A. Walter's death record. Now, do we know for 100% sure that that's the same Walter 
a Wilcox. We don't, but boy, we have been given a gift of middle initials. I'm not saying A is the least common middle initial, but it really does help dial it down because we got Chester, but we have a problem here, which is that this is Betsy Cross, which has no resemblance at all to Maria. Although Maria E could indeed be, this is where you, boy, you have to know some stuff about English language names at this point. Oh, look, we have a find a grave record here for a Maria or Mariah Elizabeth Wilcox. So this is where now I'm thinking, okay, these are interesting. Every one of these other records is saying Betsy. Betsy Wilcox, Betsy Cross. Betsy Wilcox, Be Betsy Cross. We have Walter A., who appears to be Walter Alonzo. And then we have Albert W. And if you watch some of my earlier streams where we worked on my grandfather, Ella's husband, Eugene Hammond, you will remember that at this time period, um, Eugene did a thing that I have seen lots of men and women, mostly men though, do um, in this same time period, which is used their first and middle names interchangeably. They swapped them around because there were times when Eugene A. Hammond went by either E.A. or A.E. or Adelbert Eugene or Adelbert E. And once I figured out that that's the same person and he's just playing around with his name because it's fun, it turns out that a lot of people did that. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to find a record of an Alonzo W. and find that he, for some period of his life, used his middle name as his first name. And therefore, if I see an Albert W, the likelihood that that is William A, who was Walter's brother, right? We can scroll up here and see, we have a William A, decent chance. That doesn't mean it's proof, it's just a good chance. It's a decent chance. So now I'm curious, I wanna go see what is up on Find a Grave. Let me go look at Find a Grave. Can I get directly to, no, I've got to go a couple hops here. Because, oh, look. See, now this is why it's not the worst thing in the world to go look at Find a Grave, right? This is a pretty good deal because somebody uploaded a record. There's a record. It's a record. Okay, can I zoom this? Come on. Oh, you original, yes. It's a record. This is a copy of a marriage record. Mary, January the 8th, 1852, in harmony, after being sworn and duly something according to law, by me and found the parties lawfully prepared for matrimony, some little word, Mr. Chester C. Wilcox of Milton Rock County, Wisconsin to Miss Mariah E. Cross of Harmony, married in Harmony, Township of Harmony, Miss Mariah E. Cross of Harmony, Rock County, Wisconsin, in the presence of Mr. Willis, Will, Will something, Will, Mill, Will, Ben, Bonham, Benham, of Harmony, Rock County, Wisconsin, and Mr. John L. Wilcox of Milton, Rock County, Wisconsin, January the 29th, 1852, what? Married the eighth. I can't tell if they were married on the eighth or the 29th, and I don't care. Joseph D. Wilcox, Minister of the Gospel. Oh, it's beautiful. That's great. So, filed February 2nd, 1852. I can't tell. 
what would make sense to me is that the 8th is the license, the 29th is the marriage date, the 2nd is the date it was filed. That would make sense. It's not totally clear to me that that's what it says. But look, it's a marriage record. And it was on Find a Grave. Uploaded by another user. So I take back all the bad things I said about Find a Grave. Not, not really. I take back a few of the bad things I said about Find a Grave. Right? You can find some pretty good stuff here. So somebody, a cousin maybe they're not even on Ancestry, has dropped the information that they know here on Find a Grave for me to find. So that tells me we've got sometime in January of 1852. And what we see here... Okay, see, and then here's a good example of how we can kind of put more facts together. Um, gravestones are oftentimes a treasure trove of this kind of information. Um, caution about gravestones. They also were put up and the facts on them were, were entered by the survivors of the deceased. So they're not always accurate. Further back you go, the less likely they are to be accurate. But what was really neat was if you got somebody who they were, the, likely somebody actually knew, right, is that they can have, and in this time period, had this lovely amount of detail. So what we have here is, oh, look, we have Betsy M. You have to know about English language names that Betsy is short for Elizabeth. Um, there was a time period where lots of those names got short, and it's the same kind of weird thing as, um, um, as like Peggy being short for Margaret which it was, and Polly being a variation of Mary, and Patsy being a variation of Martha. Those were ones I learned after I started doing family trees, because you'll get sometimes the full name used in a formal document, but then every other place that they are described, they use their nickname. So in this case, we're going to draw kind of a chain it's not my favorite chain. It's not as solid as I would like, but 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 work with me here. We've got a somebody whose formal legal name, birth name was Mariah Elizabeth. And so went in some census records as Mariah E. Mariah E, fine. But what we're seeing is that Elizabeth shortened to Betsy may have been the name she went by for various periods of her life and that Mariah Elizabeth might be Betsy M. Boop. Betsy M. And that a Mariah E. Cross married Chester C. Wilcox. Here we see his name is spelled with two L's instead of one. I don't consider that too big a deal. Uh, we are in an era where spelling became more standardized. But I'm still not going to make too big a deal out of two L's versus one L. Probably. And what we see is this. We see that this Betsy died at the end of the year in 1860. November 30th. Useful to know about the United States federal census that those were typically done over the summer. So whatever facts are in the 1860 census is whatever was true as of the summer when the census takers were going around and getting the data. And therefore, something may happen in the same calendar year, but it's a few months after that was taken that changes everything. And this appears to be that, right? All we knew was that she wasn't in the 1870 census, which gave us a 10-year window of something happened that broke that family up. But it looks like that something was actually right at the end of 1860. And what else do we know? Well, we also know that she died at age 26. That is probably, so aged 26. This would be, you, you want to go either send somebody to get a higher resolution photo. Oh, wait, maybe the original is higher resolution. And it's a little higher. Yeah, that is a little helpful. Or, or go take a rubbing. This is why those are popular. Or, because um, if you can really, really see the texture of the rock, sometimes you can see it better. Sometimes these things, God help us, especially in places where they made these out of limestone, which melts in water. 
Sometimes these really will just be too worn down to read. It will happen. But I think we have enough on here to be able to see that it says November 30th, 1860. Right? Because we know this is a three because we've got those bumps on the side. We've got that eight has got that very dramatic slash across. So we know this is not an eight and that this is not a three. Right? Okay. okay. Of course it's not a three. Sorry. I'm being dumb. Um, age 26, I think it says. Right? Because that straight line at the bottom of the two is really pronounced. And that six is... Definitely, and it's italic, so that's a little different, but that doesn't look like an eight to me because we've got that clear line all the way up, right? And then if I were to wild guess, I would say that that's probably the letter Y for years, right? And then this is probably an eight. What I don't know is whether that is eight days or eight months, and then I have absolutely no idea what the rest of this is. So it, I would expect for the spacing that if it was, well eight something yeah i don't know i don't know but 26 years is close and i mean that's enough information that is a lot of information so we now know lordy now i gotta go do math 1860 minus 26 is going to give us a birth year of 1834 sorry 1834 which matches what we knew from the 1860 census which was about 1835 close enough give or take a year for me is almost always close enough so hello around what time period have you found spelling became more consistent good question um if i were to massively overgeneralize, i would say 1700s forget about it 1800s you start to see it more uh the question is can i be more precise than that because is it more i mean this is these are records that are that are mid to later 1800s um i'm trying to think about those those 1820 records that we saw for um antipas hammond in the 18 uh, 1814 and 1821 were some of the court records that were kept then and those you get like you can say it may also be different by region um, but for those records which were upstate new york and they were court records we saw that the handwriting was nicer right the 1700s records for that same family back in whitingham vermont were a mess right that was just the town clerk was busy that day and they just scribbled some stuff in the town book and it was hard to read and it wasn't lines weren't straight and all that and you got we got into the the 1814 and 1820 records they were more standardized they were neater the lines were straighter they were generally a little easier to read i don't know if that just means that that particular town clerk was really diligent or if it is it may also be a later hand copy of an earlier record that was a mess um but certainly by the mid 1800s, we start to see that even though records are mostly still kept by hand, that it does seem like they are neater and uh, a little easier to read. I think that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if there is a um, if there is a single answer to that uh, that has to do with technology, right? Because we're not talking about, like obviously by the time we get to typewriters um, and and mass reproduction of records. Uh, we start to see that a lot more. But uh, even in handwritten records, stuff is a little bit more reliable. It has, it's it's almost like a modernization of thought rather than a modernization of the tech, which is interesting. Okay, so we are here thinking, is this, so we now know, okay, I think whoever read the stone in person thinks that that is 26 years and eight days is what they think. So they think her birth date was November 1834, which is plausible, right? So say November 21st, November 22nd ish is what they think it is. Um, I don't usually bother getting that super precise, although I might make a note of it um, because maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, um, but Sorry, let's get back to what we were trying to establish here. Something that is also interesting. So we have a marriage record that we found. So we have the age is correct. 
C.C. Uh, C. Wilcox fits that he went by Chester C. Wilcox. Uh, and that she fell off of records between 1860 and 1870. This explains why that might be, right? This gives, it, this gives us an accounting of why that might have happened. Uh, we have the marriage record now that says, right, that this is, it gives us her birth name. So Chester C. Wilcox of Rock County, Wisconsin to Miss Mariah E. Cross. And 1852, let's check that. Why, yes, a marriage in 1852 very nicely fits our facts about this family because their first child is born in 1852. Now, how close together in 1852? We don't know yet could might not find out could be fun all right but but that all those things fit together did we see anything that was a red flag that says maybe these are not the same people i don't see a red flag yet right um it's very tempting to say that the lack of a red flag means that it's proof that they are the same it's pretty it's pretty good it's pretty good but it's not perfect fine great right um it's not that it's not perfect it's just that it's a little incomplete um but I like it a lot. If we do that, let's just, without taking this record yet, let's go back and see what that does. Because what we've now done is we've now tied the notion of this Mariah E to a headstone with the name Betsy M. Remember that we're trying to tie together, now we're actually trying to tie together three things. This profile that I have from the 1860 census with that gravestone with that marriage record. I only have somebody say so that that gravestone and that marriage record are the same person. So we really have three records that we're trying to pull all together, but they all help support and tie to each other. So the marriage record gives us Mariah E. And it fits the facts about 1860. Uh, because it's dated 1852, which matches when their first child was born, and it's married to Chester C. Wilcox. So that marriage record ties to two things that we know about the 1860 census record. So far, so good. The marriage record doesn't say her age, but that is a reasonable age to be at first marriage. Right? So that would put her being married at about age 18. Totally reasonable. Uh, then we have the marriage. So the marriage record gives us Mariah E. The headstone is Betsy M. So we're still thinking that's a tenuous connection to Mariah E. But, but it could work, right? And the headstone gives us died in 18... Uh, wife of C.C. C. Wilcox. And died in 1860 and age 26. It gives us those things. So age 26 works with the marriage record. C.C. Wilcox in the marriage record and C.C. Wilcox in the gravestone works. And all of that works with 1860. So now we want to go looking for... If we come back here and take a look at these records, remember that our challenge was all these hints that popped up that we have Walter A and potentially, sorry, I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see me, uh, Walter A, Walter A, Walter A, and Albert W, which we think could be William A, right? So we have Walter Alonzo and William Albert or Albert William. So those two, those two fit Plus, we have that each one of these has a Chester Wilcox in it, right? We're going to assume that that T is an error and that they meant an X. We feel good about that. So we have the Walter and Chester. That fits the 1860 census really nicely. And each one of these records has a Betsy or a Betsy, a Betsy Wilcox or a Betsy Cross. And that matches both the gravestone and the marriage record. So I think between all of that, you see how we've tied all of those records together in a big old networking circle diagram, right? But that pulls together all of these other facts that makes us think that is probably a reasonable picture of this mother. So what we now think that we can do, why don't we do that? 
we're going to go Mariah Elizabeth, Betsy Cross. And she was born 1835, sure, 1834, sure. And now we know that she died November 30th, 1860, I think in Rock, Wisconsin. Rock County, Wisconsin. We don't know exactly which town she died in, right? So we know she died in the county somewhere. And we're going to find that she is, and that's where she's buried, is in Rock County. Ta-da. So now if we go to Ella's, back to Ella's profile, we have an idea of not only who her parents were, but why is she living with other family members in the 1870 census? Well, Thing one is that her mother died. So her mother died when she was about four, four years old. Sorry, four. So Ella's mother passed away when she was about four years old. Um, and therefore, by the time she was 14, she's living with the aunt and uncle, right? Uh, we, we find out later that that's an aunt and uncle. Um, we haven't done that yet on the stream, but there she is. And we know she may very well have been there that whole 10 years, right? That's very, very plausible. So now we have my grandfather's mother and we now have her mother. And now we can go back and look. Now, we could easily go in and fill in. I won't go ahead and I won't bother adding all of these people. Uh, but we can, right? We've got these folks. That's all the different records about. So we've got a death record for Albert W. We've got a death record for Walter Alonzo. So he moved to Michigan. He moved to Iowa. We do not have any records for the other siblings, for the other sibling, for Mary. That's who my cousin is descended from who contacted me. What do we know about Mary? Mary L. Wilcox, plenty of stuff. Uh, yes. So we now have Mary Wilcox. Mary's a William Reader. I happen to know that that's right because that's my cousin's line. So he knows perfectly well who she married and who her children were. So that's going to tell us more about the life of Mary. And then that leads to awesome cousin who did this research and pointed me in this direction. Okay. Right. And so at this point, do we want to take the question mark off? I don't know. Maybe. And since we're doing moms today, I'm very tempted to go research Chester. And Chester's all super shady. And the story that we got from my cousin, which is um, we find in, oh, newspaper. Oh, newspapers are the best. Newspapers. This is a time, right? 1800s is when we start to have printed newspapers in communities and they're, man, 1800s newspapers are gossipy as heck. They have all kinds of amazing, all the way up through the 1950s, especially in smaller towns, man, newspapers had everything. It's so good. There's not a concept of personal privacy like we have now. And that made it really easy for me to go snoop in all these poor deceased people's business. So we know, I'll just, I'll fill us. Uh, I wonder if I can find this. Hang on. I'm going to open up. I'm going to do another window over here. Get another window. Um, cause this is going to be, remember that I, I'm keeping my private trees. No, I'm not putting them out on the stream because they have, they have living people in them. And I'm trying to, you saw, I, I bounced around every time I go to WikiTree. Right, my default page on Wikitree comes up as living people. I gotta find a way to, to get you all a link into Wikitree that doesn't show my private view. But um, if I go to my private tree, I should be able to get us to a page where I can show you what we found. Cause it's, it's, it's awesome. It's amazing. Okay, here's what we got. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, see now these good people are all deceased. So I can bring this over here now. I was just making sure. Okay, so remember I told you uh, when we started the stream, I have all this in a private tree. This is my fancy private tree that has all of whatever all I have. And so here we were able to find, I was able to find the um, the marriage record is actually recorded in uh, Wisconsin. Let me see, is it here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ancestry does have the Wisconsin marriage index, but 
Wisconsin, his, wisconsinhistory.org has a slightly better version. So I actually use that rather than Ancestry. Um, you will notice, eagle-eyed viewers may have spotted this go by earlier, uh, that there is a family book. Woo, family book. So that'll be cool. Uh, that's off of Chester. And indeed, it is a book about Chester's mother. So yay, maternal lines some more. Uh, but let's talk about the scandal because the scandal's fun. The scandal's really fun. Um, it's not a glorious story of research. It is a story of a cousin dropped the stuff in my lap, right? So it's a great story about the people. It is, there's no hero's tale about how I found any of this. But here's what's very cool. Uh, here. This one is newspapers. Oh, let's blow this up. How much can we blow this up? Oh, it's very hard to see. However, um, so this is from, it's going to be in the Janesville. Uh, Janesville is the large city in, in Rock County, Wisconsin. And uh, Janesville has a newspaper. Let me go see if I can find Jane. I don't think this kind of Janesville Gazette. Oh, look, I've searched that before. Um, finding the modern day newspaper is completely useless. Does nothing for us. They almost never have their own archives up anywhere. So frustrating. Almost no newspapers. So when you search the paper, you end up with today's Janesville Gazette. Useless. Doesn't help me for research at all. A uh, couple of places... I don't think it's here, but this is a super awesome secret archive. It's very limited, but holy cow, if your thing is in here, if they have your thing, they have a ton of your thing, right? They have a lot of stuff. Um, I think the deal is that Google newspaper archives stopped, they stopped are doing the archives. Like they had been on a mission of imaging old newspapers and putting them online uh, or they were pulling them from the Library of Congress has these National Archives has a bunch of these um, that are some of which are online. Hang on. Let me see if I can find that National Archives newspapers. Chronicling. Oh, I forgot about Chronicling America. Yes, let me throw that link in the chat. That is, it's so good. It's so good. Okay, so there's Chronicling America, the link. There are, yeah, national digital newspapers. So, lots of, okay, fine. So then I'll look here. Janesville, we'll look here too. I don't actually remember off the top of my head whether Google's archive is a reproduction of this archive or if Google was doing it themselves. Either way, something happened where they stopped doing it and they kind of buried it in Google and you just have to know that URL. Like there's, I don't find a link to it anywhere in Google. If you go to Google News, you just get today's news. Again, useless. I don't want to know today's news. Today's news is depressing. Uh, I don't find... I find mentions of the word Janesville, but I don't find the Janesville paper. Uh, where was the newspaper published? Sure, why not? We'll look. I don't think it's in here. I suppose I could just look for Rock County newspapers. And then what I want is between 1860 and 1870. Why not, right? Search. Beloit, Rock County Republic. Oh, okay. So notice this is, oh, this, you get this weird list because a paper that changed its name, if it was the same paper, but it changed its name or it changed its publication frequency, went from being a daily to a weekly or a weekly to a daily or whatever, they, they end up being listed as all separate things. But... That is very interesting. So what date am I looking for? I am looking for 1872 is the date that I am looking for. So Rock County could be in here. 
it could be here. It's not here, right? This is 1860 to 1861, so out of my date range. 1860, that could be. Rock County Recorder. Why not, right? Now, is it on... Oh! <coughs> this tells me that this paper existed. Available on microfilm from the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. Okay, so it's not online. So that's my next, the next obstacle is that article is probably here uh, and it's probably on their microfilm, but it's not available online. I got to go somewhere. So a uh, good chance that the Family History Library would have it if I go there for some other reason, which I might. Uh, or good chance, uh, or um, Wisconsin Historical Society, which I have a bunch of other family that's in Wisconsin. So I start to kind of put together my travel log, like where do I want to go? And the Wisconsin State Historical Society is on my list of places. Like if I did a research trip, I might go do it there. Uh, Janesville Gazette. 1865 to 1880, which is what I also would want. Let's look at that. Official paper of the city, Janesville semi-weekly, blah, 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 blah. Succeeding titles, related titles, complete holdings information. Aha! So this is everybody who has it. And some of them will have it on paper, which is wild. And others of them have it on microfilm, but it doesn't appear to have been digitized yet. All right. Final resource. This one is paid. The one, the two we just looked at, Google News and uh, Library of Congress, are free. Free, 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 free. Free, free, free. Uh, Newspapers.com, not at all free. Is not free. It is uh, a service, basically, as far as I can tell, they're either in partnership with Ancestry. Sorry, I'm moving that off my screen because I'm going to sign in and I don't want to have uh, there. Fine, fine, fine. Worry. All right. Uh, it's either done by Ancestry or it's in partnership with Ancestry because my Ancestry membership, I bought the Ancestry membership. That also grants me access to newspapers.com. So we can look here. I'm pretty sure... Uh, oh, the other thing that's pretty cool is that they are starting to index across these two sites. Um, oh, there is Janesville. Um, we're, they're starting to index across so that uh, stuff that they have done indexing uh, OCR, optical character recognition, scanned the page of the text, they will offer sometimes things out of newspapers.com as hints on Ancestry, which as they increase their collections, gets more and more useful. There are other branches of my family where that has come up and has been really helpful. Um, but I'm seeing, what I'm seeing that is super interesting is that the Janesville Daily Gazette is in there, is in there, 1872. I wanna go, well, heck, I've got the date right here because my cousin sent it to me. 18th of October, 1872. I didn't know that was in here. October 18th. I'll be darned. Is that in here? Uh, I didn't know whether that was actually the paper, the, whether it was the pa this was the paper or not. Uh, but maybe it is. It's going to be in the notices, which is going to be like probably the back page. Holy cow, maybe it's in here. Maybe it's in here. Let's go look. Oh, these are so great. Look at all these great notices. Oh, look, piano tuner. So cute. Okay. Don't know, don't know, don't know. But what can I do? Find Wilcox. Dang it. Sorry, keyboard. Off of home row. Okay, not on this page. I may be in the wrong paper, too. Totally possible. But how do I get to the page before it? Why? 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 Why can't I just navigate? What am I missing? Why can't I just page? Oh, it's down here. It's down here. It's down here. It's down here. 
Look, Circuit Court of Rock County. Yes, it's the legal notices. It's the legal notices. They look exactly like it. Okay, they look just like it. Where am I going? Oh, it's so poorly. There it is. That's it. That's, oh, hey, I, <laughs> I'm an idiot. I clipped this earlier. Okay, fine. I forgot. Okay. Okay, let's zoom in. Zoom, 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 zoom. Is it any more readable here? No, it's really not. But here we have it in context. Oh my gosh, this print is terrible. Okay, it's just as bad. Okay, so here it is. But, uh, State of Wisconsin to Chester C. Wilcox, defendant. You are hereby summoned and required to answer to the complaint of Josephine Wilcox, the plaintiff in this action, of which a copy is herewith served upon you, and to serve a copy of your answer to said complaint on the subscribers at their office in the city of Janesville in said county within 20 days after the date of this summons on you, exclusive of the day of such service, and if you fail to answer the said complaint within the time aforesaid, uh, 20 days, the plaintiff in this action will apply to the court for the relief demanded in the complaint dated August 10th, 1872. Uh, Cassidy and Merrill, plaintiff's attorneys, Janesville, Wisconsin, the summons and complaint in the above entitled action were filed in the office of the clerk of the circuit court for Rock County at Janesville on the 15th day of August, 1872. Well, this is being published in October. Okay, so the complaint date was August. Okay, the complaint, oh, in the complaint dated August 10th, 1872. Okay, so a Josephine Wilcox filed a complaint against Chester C. in Rock County in August of 1872. Uh, we don't know what the complaint was, and then this is the public summons. And the story behind this is the reason they're, part of the reason they're putting it in the paper is that they don't know where they don't know where homeboy is. So here it is. Okay, so that was just a picture of that actual thing. Uh, Janesville Daily Gazette, page three. On Newsville. Why don't I just add dummy Janesville? Oh, this one doesn't autocomplete. All the other fields in our ancestry do. Rock, Wisconsin, USA. Uh, some public summons in page three on newspapers.com. Got it. Got it. Okay, now, next time I come back in here, I'll remember where I found the thing. I hate when I do that. Okay. Such a... Such a waste of time. Oh, look, the link is even right here to newspapers.com. I'm an idiot. But, uh, so the deal. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is why I don't like Ancestry's gal gallery. Um, you can attach all kinds of things to Ancestry. My mom, love her, keeps sending me family photos, and she's like, go put this on Ancestry. Go put this on Ancestry. And can I just say... It, when you come, here, here it is, you come into Ancestry, you're here, you're doing this, you can't even see, the, the pictures aren't even here, right? The only picture you'd be able to see if you had pictures is the one here that you make the profile picture. Now, ignore me because I'm terrible. I put that profile picture as a link, as a picture that shows me that I have DNA connections to this person. Because that way, when I look on the big tree, I can see who I have DNA, uh, who I've got some DNA verification for. I find that helpful because of the goofy way that Ancestry works. Um, but other than that, like if I loaded this up with 27 pictures of Chester and I come here, there's nothing, it's, they're not here, right? It's not a photo gallery. It's not nice for that. WikiTree is almost worse. And so they're buried back here in the gallery. The other thing that's buried back here in the gallery is, is documents that aren't linked as sources from Ancestry. And so uh, this one is annoying because I forget that it exists. 
because it's hidden. It's not listed as a source. But my cousin had a transcript of the court case involving Chester Wilcox. And so it is in, oh God, Ancestry, you are the worst. It's a Word doc. And you have to download it. And so now I'm like, am I going to download this to my streaming PC? No. No, I have it on a folder somewhere else that's better for document. Like, this is a dreadful way of document management. This is terrible, right? Uh, WikiTree is not better. There's not a great place to just put documents. What you would do is, like, you wouldn't even want to paste the entire court case into the bio, right? Not on WikiTree. So... I guess you would need to host it on another repository and put a link to it in Wikitree, which I also hate. I hate all of these options. All of these options are terrible. Um, God, am I going to download this? This is the worst. Yes, I'll download it. I'll delete it later. I have, for this exact reason, I have stupid copies of this stuff all over the place. Oh, it's a text file. Yes. Okay. I, I think I did this. Okay, fine. So this is the file. But I, I didn't want to deny you all the scandal. Like, we got to talk about the scandal because it's fun. Scandal is fun. Okay, so what you got to know is this. Um, we got to go back. Here's what you got to know about the run-up to old Chester. <sighs> Chester done everybody wrong is what happened. So, yes, uh, Betsy Cross died very young. She was 26. She left behind four small children with her presumably grieving widow, Chester Wilcox. And uh, I have whatever happened to Albert, you know, William Albert and Walter Alonso. Fine, fine, fine. Um, the younger two daughters went to, was it his sibling? Yes, Chester's sister, Nancy. Look, here we found her, Nancy Jane Wilcox Finch. All right, so we know now that she existed. And that's who Ella and Mary were living with when they were in the 1870 census. We also know, let's go and look at Wisconsin history, actually, because this is cool. This is a good site. I can't remember if I showed this to you on a previous stream or not. I may very well have done because it's good and we were in Wisconsin at the time. This is lovely. This is a great local website. There are others. Um, the one in the Rutherford B. Hayes Museum in Fremont, Ohio. So good. So much good local information about families. Um, but this is another one that's decent. It has a weirdness to it that we're going to look at. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and search for Chester Wilcox and see what happens. Boom. Okay, well, that's not him. Oh, but look. Look. Yes, this is what we wanted. This is what we wanted. So if I narrow it down to Rock County, boom, I get two marriage records. So let's uh, just do that. This one. Now, I could buy the whole whatever the whole thing is, but this is also decent. Um, you will remember maybe, I think we did talk about this on the previous stream, uh, Wisconsin indexes their records separately for the bride and the groom. And so this is just the groom. But then it says possible spouse matches because it's going to go look and see who else is listed as being in that on that same date on that same page. And look, the only other marriage record that occurred, there was only one marriage that day or listed in the index for that day, it's Mariah Cross. So we now know, yep, there they are. I could order that certificate if I wanted to. I would bet you that's what the person on Find a Grave did and that's what they got. I'll bet that's what happened. Uh, I have not done it. Uh, to me, this information is enough. It gives their, their parties. But it is nice to have, remember on Find a Grave, there were some other names, right? It was who their sponsors were or their witnesses. Those are useful. Um, my cousin pointed out the name of Mariah's sponsor on the marriage record was actually a clue that led to her parents because she also had a family that was disrupted when she was young and it made her records a mess. 
So that actually was super helpful in verifying who she was and where she came from. Uh, but so more than just the names is useful if you can get it. So ordering that certificate from the state of Wisconsin, not a bad idea. So this tells us this is Mariah. Well, that's not to the scandal yet. Mariah passed away young and missed the whole thing. But here in 1864 in Rock County, it stands to reason that grieving widow with four young children might have seen fit to remarry. And so here we have that he remarries and we go look for his spouse. And what we find is Josephine Jenkins. That matches what we have back here on Chester's profile page, right? So I added her ages ago, right? She's in here. Well, here's what has happened. By 1872, uh, this is not the original text of the complaint. This is her testimony in court and Chester was a no-show at this court date. So remember that we had, she filed a complaint, Josephine here filed her complaint in August of 1872, and then the summons was published in October of 1872. And so now we have moved on ahead to November of 1872. The summons was, we go into court, you better show up, he doesn't show up. Josephine has to testify in her complaint. Here's what she has going on. And I know I will not read the whole thing to you. You are welcome to glance at it. <laughs> hey, Christian, good to see you. Yes. Download documents. Yes. Okay. Oh, Iffy. Hey, Iffy, thank you for joining. So good to have visitors. All right. Scandal. We're doing family scandal. It's so much fun. Uh, this is my no good ancestor, my third great grandfather, third third great grandfather, Chester Wilcox. He is a bum. I'm going to find out he is a bum. Well, maybe. Oh, second great grandfather. Or maybe he's just a, a victim of circumstance. We don't know. But uh, Josephine says, is the defendant your husband? Yes. Married 1864. Oh, look, that's that record. Uh, married in the city of Beloit. She's got her marriage certificate. They lived together. They kept house. How long did you live together? For two years. Up until, oh, this poor woman knows the exact date. October 6th, 1866. And she describes, was your marriage okay? And she says, far as I knew. And the question is, what became of him after that date? And she says, he went away. Don't know where. Uh, in the morning, horse and buggy. Drove away from our house. Never seen or heard from him since then. No word, nothing. Do you know where he is? Nope. And it says, did he go away with anyone? He went alone from our place. On whose farm were you living at the time? Living on Mr. Parsons' farm. <laughs> did anyone else disappear at the same time that the defendant did? Yes, sir. Mr. Parsons' daughter. <laughs> So Chester, the absolute bum, maybe, or, you know, tragic star-crossed lover, I don't freaking know, 38 years old, 38 years old and been married, married with four children, uh, runs away with the daughter of his landlord, age 23. Has she been seen or heard from since? Nope. Do you know whether they went away together? I don't know. Couldn't say. Did you see her go away? Yes. Which way did she go? Same direction as him on the same day, about an hour later. <sighs> Have any of them ever come back? No. Never came back. So 1866. So that is six years later she is testifying. Never heard. Right? And like, oh, 47. 47. Why do I have his age wrong? She might have. Does she have his age wrong? I don't know. 47. Interesting. Was he married before? Yes. Do you have another wife living? No. Yes. Hey, did he have, look at this. Did he have any children by his former wife? Yes. They live with his sister, Mrs. Finch in the town of La Prairie, Wisconsin. Two of them live with his sister. There it is, right? 
that's the whole story of Ella and Mary. That's she's talking about Ella and Mary. Uh, if you ask them if they knew where their father went, this is 13 and 14 year old girls. I asked them and she said she didn't know nothing about it. Far as we know, his children never heard from him again. Right. And so she is asking the court for some kind of support. Right. Because she's he left her impoverished there. There it is. And her father testifies. And I don't actually know what the outcome of the court case was, but. Um, the, oh, and I don't know if it was mentioned in the court case, but, uh, the landlord's daughter was also married <laughs> to someone else and they just ran off together. They ran off together. Uh, don't know. Maybe they went to go, uh, dig gold in California. We have no idea. Whatever happened to them, uh, it either didn't last very long or they changed their names or both. We don't know because, after that point, there's really nothing in the records about Chester. So, uh, but super scandals. Yay, cousin. So this is, again, this is a cousin who found me uh, through Ancestry and said, hey, I have this dump truck of awesome records about the family. And uh, I would always view that with, are we sure that the person in your records is connected to my family? And he had pretty good information about uh, you know, he, again, descended from Mary Wilcox Reader, who was one of the two that lived with Nancy Finch in 1870. But as you can see, the, the court records and the newspaper records tie, again, all those details together. So we now know that Ella's father is deadbeat dad Chester Wilcox, who took off with his much younger girlfriend, uh, much younger and also married girlfriend, uh, and ditched his daughters to go. I would guess that the daughters were already living with his sister because he's probably going, I don't know how to raise young girls or whatever, right? It's 1860s, but, um, and he's busy running for, I don't know. Uh, but uh, there they were. And then the older sons were off on their own, doing their thing. All four of those children lived to adulthood, left families, right? Pretty cool. Uh, and one of them is my great grandmother. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so we have, I did research years ago looking into what else do we know about poor Josephine. She remarried, had other children, um, you know, ended up having a pretty decent rest of her life as far as the records indicate. And then I did look up who is this landlord, who is this daughter, might we find any information about her? Maybe they left and Chester was struck by lightning on the road out of Wisconsin, right? But but no, uh, no other, no further record of her either. Um, and she left, I think she left behind, she may have abandoned, I don't remember now whether she abandoned a child too. So, uh, anyway, but there it is, little hint of scandal in my family, right? We still don't know. Maybe someday we will find records that indicate where Chester went and what happened to him, but we don't, we don't as of now know, we have no idea. Uh, but there it is. So we now have a kind of a more, hang on, let's go back to, let's go back to this tree. We now have a more complete picture of what is going on with Chester Wilcox. So we know that he is the father, right? Because we have the testimony from Josephine who said, yeah, those, those two girls living with Nancy Finch, that's his daughters. That's his children. So we now know that we have Chester Wilcox and his first wife, or his prior wife anyway, we assume that, I, I assume that was his first wife, uh, Maria Elizabeth Cross, who went by Betsy M. And she died young when Ella was only four years old. And then Ella went to live with her aunt, who is Chester's sister. We'll go ahead and plug in Chester's sister. So, yay. Yay, female relatives. We don't know yet who Chester's father was, and we'll add a sister, which is Nancy Wilcox Finch, and she's here, there, and so then that's who Ella is living with. There are ways that if I wanted to add Nancy as a stepmother or an adoptive mother to Ella in Ancestry, I could. It doesn't add a lot of value for me to do that. Um, it doesn't make the it, it it doesn't do anything on the tree that makes that visual or anything, um, so it doesn't really help me. But we now have that piece of the tree filled in, which is pretty cool. And 
So we can say, is there anything else? I guess we can add the find a grave record, right? Because we like that. Yep. We like this record right here. We looked at this earlier and said, yes, actually, that looks legit. That looks like that belongs to her. And thus, we want to say, yeah, sure. Why not November 1830, 1834? That's pretty close. Uh, we know from her census that she was born somewhere in New York, which means we're going to go back to the the arid desert of records <laughs> the arid desert of records in upstate new york is going to become our thing again uh why can't i ah there we go emerald she's buried in emerald grove cemetery and we're gonna add we can do a lot here now so we can add yep walter's on let's edit all oh, there we go walter's a match and I agree that his name is Walter Alonzo. We saw that go by in some other records. We got, I wish I didn't have to click site source for everything. He's buried in Iowa. Standardizing that, great. Then we have William Albert or Albert William. And they used him interchangeably. Is there one that is right or wrong? I don't know. Right. He, he swapped them because I what I will oftentimes what I will do is I will say that the correct one is whatever the earliest variation is. So the one that was used when they were the youngest. So in his census, when he was eight years old, his parents said his name was William. Did he change it when he got older? Yeah. But you may also find that his parents changed it before he came of age. So. I just kind of go by the def the definitive one is the one that's that's the earliest dated one. Um, but you might go by if there's one that they switched to and then permanently used from that point on. You might say that that one is. Which one is their real name? Well, you know, what does that even mean? So, and then we're going to add Mary. Uh, you saw before we had that, that user interface that was kind of in the middle of the screen. I'm sorry, Ancestry, I like. What's nice about this one is that I can cross-reference. I can see what's on this other half, sorry, other half of the page. And then I've got the one that I'm trying to add. It is kind of nice to be able to do that. I'm going to add, remember that I do for siblings, for female siblings who marry, I'm not going to add her spouse because I don't care about researching her spouse. Reader is not related to me, but I do care that Reader was her surname. So I add it in the last name field in just in Ancestry. That's just a thing I do for Ancestry. It's because it's gonna get me more hints about her that I want. Uh, there we go. We're just standardizing all of these bad boys. That's nice. I used to have to hit a button to get it to, to trigger the pop-up and now it just triggers the pop-up, which is nice. Okay. He flip-flops his name because his mother did with hers too. Yes, exactly. Well, they all did, right? So, okay. We have added a bunch of new information for everybody. We now have death dates, right, for, for the older children, which is exciting. And we don't have Chester's burial place, and we probably never will. And we had, oh, it didn't offer us this, but we had, um, we had a hint of who her parents were. Um, I'm actually curious about this. Am I going to be able to look at this without? Am I going to be able to look at this without downloading? What on earth is this? Oh, for heaven's sake. That's not a real source. I was hoping that would be from a book. It's totally not. It's from somebody else's tree. So annoying. Okay, don't care about that. Don't want that. Ignoring that. Ignoring that. Um... Again, I'm, I'm picky about other people's information because what I want to know is where did they get it from. Um, I fell in love with that find a grave record over here because we had these two beautiful things on find a grave. And one was the picture of the gravestone itself, which had data on it. And the other was that copy of the marriage record. Right, so that gave me, that gave us lots of stuff. That doesn't tell me, neither one of those things tells me these facts about her parents here. William and Eliza is who this they think the, the parents are. Those aren't, that's not records. So what I want to do now is go find the records, which we don't have right now. Uh, but let's take a look at where this leaves us in our tree today. When we started, we had, 
Oh, I entered a placeholder for Wilcox because in order to add a sibling, you have to have a parent. Uh, so we, we assume he had a father and likely his name was Wilcox, although that could, that could change. But, uh, but, uh, in order to add Nancy, cause I wanted a record of Nancy, like, oh yeah, that's who Ella is living with. That's why I put that there. And so we have a bazillion little hints that could take us in a bazillion different directions. But here we have Betsy Cross and the, the Betsy Cross ones are all for her children. They're not for her origin, right? These hints are all just a uh, child's death record, child's marriage record, child's death record, child's death record, child's marriage record. So we don't have, none of these are for her with her parents. I wonder if I did a search. I was stuck on her for years. I remember this. Okay. Because there were four plausible, pl equally plausible Mariah or Betsy Wilcoxes. Four of them. Oh, sorry, not Wilcox, because if I'm looking in 1850, I don't want Wilcox, I want Cross. She wasn't married yet. So I want Mariah Cross. So what I want to do is I actually want to tell Ancestry. I don't want results with Wilcox yet. I want to look in, I want to look in 1850, which means I'm going to take these out. They didn't, none of them existed yet. And now we're going to search here. I'm still looking at census records generally, but I already know it's not 1880 because she is deceased by then. So I want, and I won't find her in 1840 because individuals weren't listed by name then. Therefore, the only place I'm going to find her under her pre-married name is going to be in 1850. So I want to look at this and here's what I recall. I was stuck here for years with, I remember it being a solid four plausible census records that could have been my Betsy Cross. Here, lots of these. And it's, I, I think I had narrowed it down from this list to four, but like 1834, 1834, 1835, 1834. And remember that I say, give or take a year. There's another 1834, 1836s. So let's go find, because we actually, we actually have the answer. I didn't know it for a long time. Ha ha, here it is. We have the answer as to which one of these is the correct one. And it is over here on the marriage record. Remember that I said, here's our breadcrumb. The index on Wisconsin history, which I don't have up anymore. I think I closed that tab. The index on Wisconsin history had just the date and the spouse's name, right? Mariah E. Cross, Chester C. Wilcox. Notice that that E and that C are different in the same exact way, right? That seems to have been the style of writing those letters at that time. Um, if I only had the Wisconsin in history index, which for many years is all I had, because I didn't order this record. Um, and when you order the record, you never know if you're going to get a treasure trove of extra information. Oftentimes, the, the marriage certificates don't have additional information, especially if they were of age. If both parties were of legal age, they don't put parents' permission or whatever. But sometimes they do need permission or they do have sponsors or it's a church record or whatever. So this gave us... This is why I was stuck for years, is that I didn't order this record. Somebody did, and thanks to them, what we have is this name here, in the presence of Mr. Will something Bunham, right? Something something, of Harmony, Rock County, Wisconsin. So we have that name, and then we have John L. Wilcox. Reasonable bet that John L. Wilcox is the sponsor or, or best man or standing up for or witness or whatever for Chester, right? Wilcox, Wilcox. Uh, but why doesn't she have somebody named Cross? She has this Willis Benham. Well, if we go back here to one of the candidate census records, we can hover over on Ancestry. Woohoo! Oh, look! Mariah Cross is living in a household with somebody named Willis Benham, who was 
her sponsor of her marriage in Wisconsin. So this one is my Mariah Cross. Didn't know that for many, many years. And it was, in fact, the cousin who contacted me who said her marriage record lists Willis Benham. And I'm like, that's one of the ones I've been looking at. So now we know. So you all get to do that journey very short. That took me years. But now we know that this still doesn't tell us a lot, but we have her living in, oh, look, a household with people that are not her parents, just like her daughter did. So we are going to go here. We're going to go Mariah. And I will say, man, in our, our, this is, we're wrapping up our kind of celebration of maternal lines and moms in the month of May. And we see here kind of Mariah and, spoiler alert, her mother are a great illustration of some of the challenges of researching maternal lines because both Mariah and her mother died very young, almost certainly in childbirth, and left behind families of young children who then had to be shipped off to live with other relatives. Both of them had this scenario played out exactly the same. You kind of wonder about, um, there's a scene in Victoria in the, the PBS thing about Queen Victoria, which is so great. You should all watch it. Um, there's a scene in the first season of Victoria where she talks about how her, uh, the, you know, the queen is like 18 or 19 or 20 or whatever has become queen um, and is recently married. And she, her, it's not her mother, but I think it's her grandma, whoever it is, one of the, one of somebody in the royal family, the princess, somebody had died very tragically young in childbirth. And she's like, I don't want to have children. I don't want anything to do with any of that. I don't want to die. Right. And she's looking at it going, is there something genetic in our family that's going to make childbirth high risk for me? And it's going to kill me. And before she has her first child, like that was the reality then for sure was that women didn't know. Right. Or maybe they did know and there wasn't a darn thing they could do about it. And we know the story of, like, Queen Victoria had a happy ending because she had 12 children and uh, was fine and, you know, died of old age. Um, so that worked out great for her. But to be someone whose mother died very young in childbirth and then to be facing childbirth yourself thinking, I wonder if what went wrong for her will go wrong for me. And in this case, it may have, right? Because she died in, why do I have that? That dates off, but because she died in 1860, which by this spacing would have been consistent with, um, oh, let's see, into there, would have been very consistent with her um, potentially being pregnant with another child. We don't know. Oftentimes that wasn't recorded, um, and the death record may not have recorded if it was, uh, you know, earlier on in a pregnancy or stillbirth or whatever, but. Uh, we now know that something happened before 9, 1850 to disrupt Mariah in her family's household so that for whatever reason, she is not living with her parents. She is living with Willis Benham. And if we, I closed that window so I could go back and look for whatever all we found on her. I may do that for next time. But what we know from that piece of research is that she was the daughter of William O. Cross. More information, again, that I got from my awesome cousin. Um, I should do like a whole stream of just talking about all the awesome cousins that just pop up. And we talked about that earlier, right? The reason I have a picture of Ella Wilcox is because a cousin who is descended from my grandfather's brother, who for our purposes was a long lost brother, right? Uh, a cousin who was descended from his brother uh, knew and had a family picture of Ella. And she was, that was recent. That was within the last couple of years that she found me and said, oh, hey, I know what happened to Irving. I'm like, Irving? Like I had looked everywhere for Irving. Anyway, so cousins finding you and they've done their own research and they have more that they can share with you can be a fantastic source of information. Ancestry is a decent place to find those people, but in recent years, I have had better luck on Wikitree. Uh, as more people are discovering Wikitree and they are finding that, hey, exciting news, it is free, 
right? And you can, and it has tools in it that it is built for collaboration in a way that Ancestry has actually removed some of the collaboration tools that they used to have. Um, and so it's, it's great to have a presence on, um, I don't yet have a big family search tree community uh, that, that I am aware of, but I betcha it's coming because they keep making that tree better. So uh, we know from Cousin that her father was William O. Cross. We get a bunch of hints on ancestry when we plug that in. You see how this all kind of plays off of each other, right? I get a little bit of information from somewhere. I plug that little bit of information in here into ancestry and armed with a little bit of information, I get a ton of hints that come up and those may point me to records. So the detail about William comes from a hint from a family member, but I can then go substantiate that by digging in and plugging it in here. Oh, super curious. Is this a family book? So William O. Cross, does he show? Oh, that's an, oh, this pains me a little bit. Um, this is Daughters of the American Revolution. So, um, and D.A.R., is these days in particular, DAR is very, very rigorous about who they consider to be, to have been um, a somebody of the American Revolution. I don't know if they were always that rigorous throughout their whole history. But what we get here, um, so this is not an application. This is an actual lineage book, which means... So we're looking at, this is a person who is saying, here's her lineage from a, a DAR patriot. Um, and so she's saying um, in this directory, I'm a descendant of Uriah Cross through these people. And so that's telling us a whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, not my favorite sources of that information. I forgot that the way I... The way I originally substantiated just having this William O. Cross is, uh, and this will be a whole other stream that we can talk about this, but uh, I originally found that I had a DNA connection to descendants of Lucy Tripp, who was another one of William Cross's children. And so that DNA connection was what sort of shored up the idea that this is who we're descended from. And in fact, here we have, um, we have William Cross and his spouse, Eliza Bigelow, and Eliza Bigelow died in 1834. And that date becomes interesting because Betsy Cross was born in 1834. So we now know, we are able to piece together this ends up being true, that Betsy Cross didn't just lose her mother as a young child, she lost her mother at birth. The death in childbirth that happened was that birth. So her mother died giving birth to her. And so she never knew her mother at all. And she would have grown up with, by the time we see her, right, at age 16, I think it is, um, shortly before her marriage, she's with what ends up being an aunt or an uncle. And um, we don't know where she was before that, but she may have been with, let's say, her father and a stepmother. Right. But she never knew her biological mother because her biological mother died same time she was born. Um, there's a little confusion about the records and the dates. This is why that 26 years and eight days on her headstone is a little odd, um, is that I think when we found it, the record of the day her mother died and then the day she was born are in the wrong order. So something is a little off there, but it is within the week. You know, and so it would, you know, it would make sense that her mother could have lingered for a few days before passing away, for example. So that's a depressing note to end it on. Um, but we do know that Mariah's mother was Eliza Bigelow. There. And that Eliza Bigelow married William Cross in what did that say it said because we have that uh, that came up here it was a marriage record here we go married that's william c cross but that's close enough right because a c and an o you could you could imagine that that might have happened that way 
uh, this one is in fact them. Um, I checked that. That was that's one I have in my tree from before. And so this marriage record 1826 may mean that there are more children before Mariah. Right? Makes sense. Uh, because there was enough time for them to have had other children before Mariah, but but not enough time to have had any after because she dies at Mariah's birth. There it is. So we now have... Oh, and if we go to, hey, he is here in the 1850 census. So his daughter Mariah is living somewhere else with someone else. And he's potential, this could be him. Honestly, we don't know for sure yet. But uh, that could be our William in having set up his own household. There's a few other records in here that may or may not be the same guy. Um, but that starts from this, this DIR profile here. And it is indeed, it is true. Uh, this is accurate, that he is the son of Uriah Cross and Anna Payne. And that one of his other children is a Lucy Cross, who married somebody named Tripp. And those people are my DNA cousins. And so now we have more cool stuff built out about where we started here. Let's center you in the tree, Ella. There. So we can wrap up with that. When we started today... We had a pretty good amount of information on, yeah, let's center Harry here, on Harry's father, Eugene, on the father's side of the tree. But we hadn't done as anywhere near as much about Ella, his mother. And so here we are on the last day of maternal month, and we're filling out more information about the mothers on the tree. And we see now why it was challenging to put that information together because we have Ella's mother dying very young and therefore there just weren't very many records that existed of her and we now know Mariah's mother Eliza Bigelow also dies very young and we don't have and this makes it hard to have we don't see them in the same household with each other we we got lucky that we had Mariah and Ella in the same household once in 1860 right before Mariah passed away. Uh, but we don't have, uh, Eliza and Mariah will not be in any census record together because Eliza died in, we know, uh, 1834, 1834, there. That's all we know for her for the moment, right? So we don't have any census record for her. So we'll be piecing that stuff together, similar to what we had to do over here in the world of Antipas and Bulow, where the, their, the time period where they lived doesn't fall into the census records where people were listed by name. So same kind of deal over here. We will find, we found the thing that kind of tied the whole Chester Wilcox family together was that court record. We don't always get the fun, scandalous court record, but in this case we did. Um, I think with William Cross, we're going to find that it's probate. We're going to tie everything together by him leaving a will and his descendants and so forth. Um, and so then Mariah might have been listed as one of his descendants. Another challenge that we will sometimes run into is that for those daughters who die young because of disease or childbirth or whatever, uh, they oftentimes predecease their parents so that she maybe passes away before her father does, because that's quite young, 26. He, die, he lives much longer, leaves a will, right? But she's not named in it because she's no longer living. She's not a living heir. Uh, sometimes you can tie this guy together to these children because the grandchildren might be named in the will as inheritors of their mother's share. I don't remember whether that happened with William Cross, but it is a godsend when you can find something that works like that because now you've got all three generations tied together in this one document and that can really help you build the whole thing out. But we have two more generations than we did and we have a decent amount of information and a story about them and some siblings. So we've done, I feel like we've done a little bit more justice by Ella who just didn't get the attention that she deserved earlier this month. Um, and there she is. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, there it is. Looking pretty good. So, yeah, no kidding. Skin color. Um, 
so at this point uh, we're wrapping up we're wrapping up maternal lines month and I finally got a little bit organized about uh, trying to have a list of stuff I want to work on on the stream some different kind of techniques and parts of the tree that will show you some different stuff um, what we have very solidly been in on my grandfather's tree is these are all folks of European descent. I think every single one of them is of descent that traces back to England and not any place else. And we're following them back through the northern United States, through the Midwest um, or the you know Great Plains, and then back into um, the Northeast. And ultimately, I think like every single one of these lines go, goes back to New England. So we're really still looking at, though there are lots of names, a very narrow slice of what there is in the world of genealogy. Um, and so there's a lot of different journeys that we can go on just in looking at my tree. Um, I'm gonna keep talking about my tree until one of y'all brings a tree, um, and then we can talk about your tree. But, um, and, and my tree has a couple of different ways of researching and different regions and different histories that we can look at. I'm not that diverse in my heritage. My DNA story is 99.99% European descent white person. But I do have a few things because I have a mix of, on my mother's side, we have some more recent immigrants from white people in Europe. Um, and so that at least looks a little bit different. I was going to show, oh, I want to show you a cool thing that I built. Is that here? Is that on this tab? It is not. Okay, fine. Uh, let me go see if I can find that because I did build a cool thing because I was bored. <laughs> uh, is it this guy? I think it's this guy. Be this guy. Yes. Yes, this is fun. This is super fun. Check it out. My mom wanted to know where her people all came from. And so, because I'm a big dork, I made a Google map to answer that question. Um, I made it by hand. You don't have to. Uh, there are ways to import data into Google Maps that could probably do something like this. But this is a pretty good idea of like, so when we talk about my grandfather's history, the people we've been looking at, we're talking all, not only all right here, but probably all like right here. They probably all came from like right there. Um, but my mom's family is a mix of Polish, bunch of Polish here. Uh, the Poland research story is another glorious tale of how amazing it is when cousins find you through WikiTree. So, uh, many lead, the leads that I got that led me to records here were all from, hey, did you know they put new Polish records on? online in Poland. No, I didn't know that. Um, this branch in the part of Germany that's very close to the Netherlands, this branch was all an earlier researcher who did all of her work on paper and is just a, like, I am not worthy of all the work that was done in church records on paper for this family. Um, that's part of my mom's family from that part of Germany. We've got the other part of my mom's family from Switzerland. I think I mentioned that we had the Swiss cousin with the book. Um, we have a little branch here that went to Maryland. They are very difficult to study, but there is a book or like a research paper. And then all of these folks, no, the orange ones are the, I call them the New England blue bloods, right? But the, like the, the early, early, early settlers of New England in the 1600s, that's the orange dots here. But the other colored dots are the another wave of English settlers that came in the mid 1800s, much, much later, much, much, much later. And then these red ones are folks that came in the, I don't even know if Wales is, is, is right, but uh, the red dots are like 1700s and I have very little information on them and they're very hard to research. And these little boats are the ship records, right? Because when they came like this is late 1800s, very late 1800s, when there were actually transport records that you could see where they like where they sailed from and stuff. Super cool stuff. Um, so and I drew lines because I can that show where they ended up when they came over. So like and which ports they came through because they didn't come through Ellis Island. <laughs> because look, the whole eastern coast of the United States is all ports. There are many places a person could come through that were not Ellis Island. 
So literally none of my relatives came through Ellis Island. My family has been asking me for years, can't we go to Ellis Island, look them up? I'm like, no. Almost all of them came through Baltimore and a lot of them came way before Ellis Island was a thing. So it's just the most famous. So it helped me, not at all. But uh, all of that is to say, this is kind of an idea of the landscape of some of the other kinds of research that exists to be done. What I am interested in is figuring out what's useful to all of you. Um, I, will, I will restate my intention is for this stream to be more interactive with you. And I would find it super fun if one of you wanted to pop in with uh, some names and dates of a deceased ancestor and we just start from scratch and build a tree. Uh, I don't know if I will be even remotely competent at helping you build out a tree on the stream, but I don't mind looking remotely incompetent on the tree if it's on, on the stream if it's helpful. Um, but I'm showing you all the stuff I've done with my tree just to give you an idea of what kinds of research is possible. Now that is something that you can just take and do on your own. Just go for it. Um, but it's also something where if you have done a little bit of research, gotten stuck, um, and want to come and explore here together, um, I am not a professional at this. I'm not even close to the best genealogist that I know. I know many better ones than me, but I'm what you got. I'm here. So uh, we could figure stuff out together. I am working on seeing if I can get some of the other folks from the other Twitch communities that I'm a part of. Um, Ify, if you're still here, offer is extended to you as well. Um, anybody who is interested in just bringing in an ancestor and saying, I don't know a whole lot about my family, let's find out what we can learn because it's pretty cool. Um, could be pretty fun. And it may be a region or a type of record that I'm really familiar with and that I can just rip through. Uh, or it may be a whole like, whoa, I've never seen that before. Um, it really, really varies. Um, but uh, but it's free, so why not, right? Give it a shot. So think about if you're viewing, and I love that we have a, a more than a hand, more than one hand's worth of viewers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're viewing and you have a question, or if you're even just sitting there and thinking, gee, I don't know anything about my family, think about it. Bring it to the stream. I would love to help you research your family. We can do that, like, seriously, anytime. I'll have a list of topics that I can talk about if no one's here. <laughs> Just, we're doing it for the VODs. We're doing it for YouTube. Um, but uh, I will also be happy to just throw the whole research plan out and uh, and work on yours on a stream sometime it really doesn't it doesn't hurt nothing all right if he says mother's family's from germany immigrated here in the 60s 1960s 1960s or 1860s don't know anything about her family beyond her immediate family that is an interesting challenge german records in are generally pretty good um, surprising, like everybody thinks, oh, it's all destroyed during the war. Surprisingly not. <laughs> High school genealogy projects are probably a bad idea. Like, I love the idea of what, like, I have learned so much about U.S. and world history from researching my family. And when there's a connection to my people, I find those pieces of history interesting. And so I think like, okay, yes, that's a great way for kids to learn. It's a, it's not a great way for kids to learn. It's a ridiculously traumatic way for kids to learn. Not everybody has a family that is happy to research, right? 19 say, yeah, that's cool. Aha, you have actual Ellis Island. That's pretty sweet. So uh, naturalized citizen might be a naturalization certificate that would have detail, right? So, oh yeah, Laura got to brag about being related to Charlemagne, you're welcome. So, yes, that's right. <laughs> so, yes, so that that would be interesting. If if you want to if you want to send me stuff on on Discord, uh, and maybe I'll poke around and see if I can find anything. I may not. There may not be anything beyond what you know. Um, it is hard. Hmm. I haven't tried to do recent Germany. All right. I just I've never. I haven't had occasion to try because. The last people I had in Germany left there in the 1840s. So for me, it's all early Germany. And then that's all like weird Prussian. But the church records are super good. 1960s Germany, I don't know. 
that would be interesting. That would be fun to find. Yeah, mother side. They don't like to talk about their family. Yes, that happened to mine too. That was why we had to go find the records. Be like, you can't hide. You have records, right? So, uh, but that would be interesting if you have, so ship's record, you have actual Ellis Island, which means you probably have actual immigration records that will say town they came from. It would be interesting to see if any of that is digitized, if there's church records or civil. Germany's really good for civil records. Generally really, really good because that it's that stereotype of Germans that they're very deliberate and thorough. If you want to play, uh, we can do that on the next stream. That would be fun. So, <laughs> yes, we have that too. So we also have the grandmother doesn't talk about because something bad happened. And I have like my aunt told us that she remembered. Oh, it's not. It's my great grandmother. It's her grandmother. Uh, she remembered her grandmother having regular screaming nightmares that would traumatize the whole house because something terrible happened to her in her childhood that we will probably never know exactly what it was. Like, we have that. So, well, and so then it, it's a good, it is a good point and a good question to think about too anytime that you are embarking on researching your family is to think about, you know, how are you, what, what do you consider to be bad information that you wouldn't feel happy about finding out? And is that something that you want to do? Do you want to go there? Uh, for me, um, I started researching the Hammond tree at a time when I didn't really feel good about, um, you know, some of the folks on my relationship with some of the folks on that side of the family. Sorry, auntie. Uh, I'll, we, we, we're, we're okay. But like she knows, like we've, I've had struggles with that side of the family. And I used to say, like, I didn't feel connected to the Hammond side. I didn't feel like that was really my family and researching that family and seeing that there were literally thousands of people that I'm descended from on the Hammond side who had nothing to do, nothing to do with the grievance that occurred in the last 20 years. And maybe some of them were terrific people and maybe some of them were terrible people, but that you start to realize that they are quite removed from all of that. Um, I found that really nice. Um, I can talk about the dudes who moved from Whitingham to uh, Genesee County, New York, and then moved on to Iowa, <coughs> Pennsylvania and Iowa and all the stuff they did and ran the rooming house in Buffalo. And like, they, they don't, I don't know if they would have liked me or not, but it doesn't matter. Like they have an interesting story and I'm here because of them, whether they like it or not. So Anyway, it was pretty cool, but it does, it is worth thinking about. Um, I, I think about the, um, the episode of Henry Louis Gates's show from three or four years ago when this is embarrassing, like all of us who do family history research, just roll our eyes at this, but like Ben Affleck found out that he had slave owners in his family history and he was, he was horrified and he asked Dr. Gates to not include that fact in the show because he was so embarrassed about it. I'm like, you and half the white people in this country, dude. Like, get in line. I have Confederate heroes in my ancestry, which I hate. And I have quite a few slaveholders. And around that time, I was like, I, I think if you had... It's not true that everybody who is descended from Europeans who had ancestors in the country at that time has slaveholders in their families. It's not necessarily the case. But... When you realize that you go back before 1820 or before into the 1700s and slavery was still legal in the North and a lot more people are descended from that, the Northern, you know, the ancient line. So like all my New England lines were likely to have had African-American chattel slavery, slavery in their histories. And it's not documented in the same way as it is in the South, but like you Northerners were not off the hook. Right. But then on my mother's side of the family, the majority of her people came over after the, you know, around or after the civil war and settled in the North. So no, they, they, they just dodged slavery because they were, they, they were after it. Uh, but it's very common, very common, at least here in the West, Right. For those of us in the West, it's really common that we may have folks that go back to a southern line, which may include either in the direct line or in some of the branches may include slaveholders. Um, I have quite a few, uh, but 
But point being, Ben Affleck, like, really kind of couldn't handle it. He really didn't like the fact that he had that. So, and I would not expect any of us to necessarily feel good about it. And it's why I'm very careful about, um, I would always and would love to offer to help do genealogy research for Af people of, of African-American descent who may be descended from enslaved people in the U.S. But I want to be very careful about not being cavalier about the fact that, like, it's much, it's so much different for them to hear, you know, for a an African-American celebrity on Henry Louis Gates's show to be hearing about their history from him who has a very similar background and he can relate to that. And I can't at all. I can only relate to the horrible people who enslaved your people. So I don't want to be cavalier about the experience of doing that research with somebody like me. Um, and so I think the same kind of thing applies, not not in degree, right? Not in uh, Not in severity, but there are little things that I, as a researcher, don't have a connection to the stories that may be hurtful in your family. So think about how you want to engage with that, how you're going to feel if you, you know, the, if you become one of those people who does the DNA test and has to write a book because of what you find out that wasn't what you thought your family was or, or what have you. I watch a lot, consume a lot of media of, of those stories happening to other people. And they haven't happened to me. So, um, but I try to be sensitive to like, Think about how you feel about what you're going to find out. Think about if there's lines you don't want to, you don't want to touch because you don't want to know, right? Or you do, but you want to do it privately and you don't want that to be here on the stream with me acting like a goofball. It might not be suited. Um, but with all of those caveats in place, um, anybody who's watching, if you're interested in doing some research coming up with, you know, cool stuff like this, building a tree on any one of the fine uh, many fine sites that we use to share this information. Uh, that's what I'm hoping to do as we grow and develop the stream is to have a lot more different research techniques that I learn, that we learn together, because you're going to challenge me with new types of research and new places and dates that I haven't done before. So modern day Germany, brand new to me. I don't know. I might end up looking like a, like an idiot, but uh, could be fun to go see what is out there. Um, and I'd love to see what you already have and see what we can put together. So uh, if you're interested, let me know. I haven't yet set up a Discord channel for this stream because we just, I don't know if people, um, a lot of the folks of, of you who are viewing are watching the videos on demand or you're watching them over on YouTube. There's a YouTube channel. It's linked in my profile. Um, you can now go see all the past episodes. Um, not everybody who's watching the stream is fully checked out as a participant on, on the Twitch ecosystem. Um, one of the tools that we often use on Twitch is another site called Discord, which is a chat server. It gives us a way to have the conversation when I'm not directly online. I haven't set up a Discord server yet for this channel because it seemed silly to do when there were like three people on it and I know you all. <laughs> but if you are watching this as a video on demand, if you are watching it over on our YouTube channel, leave me a comment. Let's talk about whether you would like to be able to have a way to connect and continue the conversation after the stream is over. Um, because when, if and when we get to a point that we have a community that's, that's chatting um, and we want to be able to share notes and maybe you all want to share with each other, we can set that up. There are tools that will allow us to do that. Um, in the meantime, those of you that are coming over from some of the other Twitch channels that, that I'm a member of, you all know that I'm on the Discord, on um, I'm on VB's and uh, Bose's, and you know you are welcome to DM me over there if you have questions. And thank you for joining. It's awesome to have a little bit of support coming, sneaking in from, uh, from the Civilization VI player community. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm not yet, not yet thinking that I'm going to stream Civ VI games, but you never know. Uh, if we get enough growth in the channel and people want to see it, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Playing and not talking about playing is like how I relax because talking like this is, is how I work. So anyway, so cool. Oh, Ify, thank you. Very sweet. Um, 
very nice to but it's nice to see you and uh that's it boy we are delightfully over time um it's common for twitch streams to run longer than two hours i just normally do a two-hour time box um but i've missed a lot because i will sometimes start up the stream and wait to see if people show up and the last uh, a couple of different weeks this past month i've been on and we just did we just didn't get viewers in the first half hour and i said some days i want to talk to the camera by myself and record a video that will go out on YouTube. And there are other days when there's there's not anyone to talk to and I'm just totally not feeling it. Um, that was last week. I have taken some steps to try to make sure that I can stream more regularly. I've got a list of topics now so that I at least have something to talk about or make a video about if nobody shows up. Um, but I'd love to, you know, um, if there are other times I'm going to be looking around for maybe other times to stream as well so that I can catch more of you because, of course, uh, the Sunday mornings when I'm live doesn't work for everybody. Um, and we'll be kind of playing around with other changes to maybe make it more discoverable. And that idea of being able to chat offline is another option um, so that if there's a week that you know you would like to make it and you plan on being here, I would love to know because then I'll stick around and we'll we'll talk or if there's something that you want to see. So... With that, though, I do think I'm going to I'm going to wrap up the stream for today. This was fun. Thank you for making it fun. This made it reminded me why I do it. I'm going to I'm going to keep at it. We're going to try to get our followers up to 50 someday. Uh, what are we at? We're at. Oh, I don't know. how. Oh, it's not on my it's not on my thing how many followers I have. But uh, but five viewers today, which is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, honestly, if we had five or six viewers every stream and occasional chat and I have to one of these days I'm gonna get the overlay working so that I can see your chat while I'm looking at the screen that I'm researching I will I will figure that out um, but it's been great to have you here thank you for supporting if you find it interesting I'd love for you to drop back by do give us a follow um, check out um, the link in the about page uh, to our YouTube channel where you can catch past episodes. At the moment, they're all just full-length episodes. You can fast-forward through the boring parts. They're all... Yeah, there's a lot of boring parts. But um, maybe someday we do edited versions. Maybe someday we do, I don't know, fun and game. I, I got a dog cam and it doesn't work yet. So I'm working on putting up a camera so that you can see the adorable puppies. Uh, super shout-out to Cranky Old Cuber for keeping the adorable puppies company today. So they did not bark a single time. It's amazing. Anyway, and happy long weekend. I hope that you are celebrating in whatever makes sense, way it makes sense to you, whether that is just chilling because you get a day off of work in the U.S. or thinking about veterans in your family or remembering, you know, remembering folks that have passed for actual Memorial Day. Fantastic. Uh, cheers to all of you in Canada who did this last weekend for Victoria Day. And, um, and I will see you next Sunday. Thanks again for joining.